Today we continue our sermon series called Real Good News. We began by exploring the meaning of gospel, which is good news. Then we talked about how salvation is about healing and wholeness now. And last week, Pastor Josh encouraged us to live our faith in public. This week, we continue in the book of Acts in chapter 6. In my sermon two weeks ago, I mentioned that even though the early church was different and beautiful, they were still imperfect. Well, that imperfection rises to the surface in our reading for today. Listen for the word of God in Acts chapter 6, verses 1 to 6. Now, during those days when the disciples were increasing in number, the Hellenists complained against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of food. And the twelve called together the whole community of disciples and said, It is not right that we should neglect the word of God in order to wait tables. Therefore, friends, select from among yourselves seven men of good standing, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may appoint to this task, while we, for our part, will dedicate ourselves to serving the word. What they said pleased the whole community, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, together with Philip, Proctorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenius, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. They had these men stand before the apostles, who prayed and laid their hands on them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In February of 1970, John M. Perkins was lying in a hospital bed, recovering from being beaten within an inch of his life, and he found himself full of hate. Life had not been easy for John Perkins. Born in Mississippi in 1930 as an African-American man, he was orphaned at seven months old when his mother died of malnutrition and his father abandoned him to be raised by extended family. He dropped out of school in the third grade to become a sharecropper. Ten years later, upon returning from service in World War II, his older brother was shot by a police officer in a movie theater. Fearing for his own life, Perkins fled to California where he got married and at age 27 became a Christian after his son invited him to church. A few years later, he returned home to Mississippi. He became an evangelist. He loved inviting people to his church and helping them read the Bible. Yet he felt convinced that God cares about physical needs just as much as about spiritual needs. As a result, he became involved in the civil rights movement supporting voter registration and desegregation. Then, in February 1970, several students had been arrested for their protesting, and he was on his way to bail them out from jail when he was pulled over by police officers and beaten within an inch of his life. That's how John Perkins found himself lying in a hospital bed filled with hate. He hated the sharecropping system, which left his mother starving. He hated the white police officer who killed his brother and now almost killed him. Recalling the moment later, Perkins said, When I saw the ugliness of hatred, I thought, boy, if I had an atomic hand grenade, I would release it and kill me and all of them. I discovered I hated them back as much as they hated me. In 1970, John Perkins felt overcome between, by the division between white and black in the American South. But that division is not new. That division is as old as sin itself. It goes back to the early, early, early church. In our scripture for today, we read that the Hellenists, that's basically a word for the Greeks, the Hellenists complained against the Hebrews, those from Jerusalem, 
because the Greek widows were, being, were not being served in the community's daily meal. The Hellenists are essentially Jewish immigrants to Jerusalem. They're in Israel, but they're from Greece. They're already hyper aware that they're from another culture. They hear a nagging whisper in all of their interactions that says, you don't belong. But in a sea of strangeness, they've found the boat of belonging, and that is the early Christian church. They belong to God. They belong among the other Christian believers. But then, suddenly, the community is broken by division. The widows, the most vulnerable people, were being neglected while everyone else was being fed. Eugene Peterson, the writer of the message, translator of the Bible, puts a finer point on what's happening here and translates this saying, the widows were being discriminated against. Even in the early church, discriminated against. Then the early church is split between the Hebrews and the Hellenists. The division in society had made its way into the church, as it does Make no mistake, though, the issue here is not the difference between one another. God loves variety. The issue is that some have used cultural difference between Hebrews and Greeks as an an excuse to treat the Greeks badly. That's division. That's the sin. And I'm sure it very quickly boiled over into blame passing and finger pointing. Now, the disciples get wind of what's going on, and I imagine they first try to fix the problem themselves. Counting plates, measuring portions, making sure everyone is getting their food. But it's not really working. Portion problems continue, as does the division. You know... In the early church, the 12 disciples really are figuring it out as they go along. So they try a new tack. They call everyone together. And they know there is much more at stake here than whether everyone gets the same amount of grits on their plate. What's at stake is not meal management. What's at stake is God's mission for the church. God's mission hangs in the balance. Paul makes this clear in his second letter to the Corinthians, which was our first reading for today. Paul points out that the nature of sin is division. When Adam and Eve ate the apple in the metaphorical Garden of Eden, they do two things. First, they hide from God, and second, they blame each other. That quickly. Division between God and us, and division between us and one another, happens so immediately, doesn't it? But God has been determined to heal that wound of division and draw humanity back into close relationship with their creator. God's pursuit of reconciliation with humanity is literally the story of the entire Bible. It is the story of all of history. This is the wonderful, awe-inspiring message of who God is. God is a reconciler. But that's not all. Paul says that God has now entrusted the message of reconciliation to us. Like tossing the keys to a 16-year-old for the first time, God has entrusted something precious to us, like a friend who confides in you about something important in their lives. God has entrusted this to you and to me. It's the sort of entrusting that can make you want to bow down in awe and say, I I can't, I'm not ready or worthy, and simultaneously stand up tall in the hopes that you might just live up to all that trust. God has not only entrusted us with the message of reconciliation, but we are God's ambassadors. We represent God to a culture and a world that has been shattered by the sin of division. We are entrusted with needle and thread 
to sew the world back together. God wants us to show the world the real good news that healing and reconciliation are possible. So in Acts, when the disciples call everybody, the Hellenists and the Hebrews, together, their task is deeper than counting plates. Their task is reconciling these two divided groups. They come up with a creative solution together. They suggest that everyone select seven good people of good standing, full of the spirit and of wisdom, to make sure that no one is discriminated against. The disciples create accountability, which sometimes we need. These seven will ensure that the vulnerable Greek widows are treated fairly, and they will also ensure that hate does not take root in the hearts of the Hebrews. No longer can one side treat the other badly. No longer can they point fingers and cast blame. Their relationship with one another is enabled to begin growing. They're still different, that will never change, but they're on equal footing for true and deep relationship. They can now walk the path of reconciliation together. And that's our mission as the church. We are entrusted with the task of being ambassadors for God's good work of reconciliation. So let's be ambassadors. Let's pursue deeper relationships with those with whom we disagree or even those we dislike. When there is difference, instead of leaning back, leaning out, let's lean in. Lean into the possibility that God might be at work in that other person's life. Lean into the possibility that that person might actually have something to teach us. This is very unfashionable in our culture right now. But this week, let's, let's take some time to notice where we hear people speaking of their un opponents in uncharitable ways and ask God, how can I be an ambassador of reconciliation here? Let's be ambassadors of reconciliation even in our personal lives. Where there is brokenness, let's seek healing. Let's ask God for help to navigate those tricky waters of accountability and forgiveness. Let's ask God to open us up like that piece of paper to forgiveness and to strengthen us to seek the kind of accountability that is needed. Let's stake our lives on the rumor of God's grace. To be ambassadors, we don't have to avoid conflict. Sometimes conflict is necessary for healing. On the other side of conflict, there can be more intimacy and trust. Reconciliation, it's not always possible, this side of God's kingdom. But we wait in hope that God just might do the impossible that God still might be a miracle worker in mending the tatters of our broken world. And we do have good hope. Just look at Jesus' body called to life from the brokenness of death. Just look at John Perkins. In his hospital bed, body broken, swollen with his own hatred, God spoke to John. And John left the hospital with a new calling, a new mission. And he said, I want to preach a gospel strong enough to overcome this hate. Strong enough to overcome this hate. I want to preach a gospel that can save white folks and black folks in our misery. To save us who want to kill each other. From then on, he dedicated himself to racial healing. God transformed his hatred into active compassion, even for those who hated him. He speaks of his life's work as helping people wash the wounds they've inflicted upon one another. He discovered the pearl of great price, that his dignity comes from God, and that God's love can free anyone from the bondage of hatred. <laughs> 
I could go on and on about Perkins. His numerous nonprofits he founded in his community, the Christian Community Development Association that he founded, his 16 honorary doctorates as a third grade dropout. But the truth is that Reverend Dr. John Perkins is simply a living miracle. He is still drawn to tears when speaking of that night where he was beaten, but he has spent the rest of his life washing wounds and binding up brokenness. He is evidence of the kind of reconciliation that only God can enact. A transformation like his is compelling, real, good news. Reconciliation is real good news.